Today we're going to start with Psalm 23, and I believe it is responsive. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The epistle reading today comes from the first book of John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our, down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth, and will reassure our hearts before him wherever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit that he has given us. The Gospel reading today comes from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep who, that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this is reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. May the Lord add his blessing to the hearing and understanding of his word. Pray for the preacher this morning. Anybody? I will. I will. Toby will. Yay. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> Lord, thank you for bringing us all here today. We praise the day and the, the ability to gather again in your house. May you have special eyes for Pastor Terry today and hands that will lay on her so that we might understand the message that you have for us through her. Please be with her as she continues to try and understand what she's going to be doing for the hmm, rest of her life. <laughs> and as we, as we end our time with her here at Epworth, may she know that we will always hold her in our heart and know that we will be here when she needs to call on us just as you are there when you, we need to call on you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? That's an interesting question. Because on Sunday morning, we get up and think, where am I going to preach today? Oh, I'm not going to preach today. I'm going to go listen to a sermon today. I will be in church someplace, I promise you that. Um, how many of you think if you were in a field charged with taking care of someone else's sheep and a wolf came, or wolves don't travel alone, you know, they come in a pack or a pack of coyotes, something like that. How many of you think you'd stay and fight to protect those sheep? I don't know that I would. But how many of you, if somebody came toward your child 
or your grandchild would not give your own life. That's a different story, isn't it? I have seen people who are just as calm as anything. When somebody messes with their kid, you would not believe what they turn into. Because it's different when it's someone who is close to your heart or someone who's part of your heart. That's what Jesus says to them. I'm the good shepherd. These are the words of our Lord. I'm the good shepherd. What do you know about shepherds in the first century? They were not exactly the highest on the socioeconomic ladder, were they? They were the poorest people in the community, and usually they were out in the field taking care of someone else's sheep or their father's sheep, and it was the job of the youngest kid in the family to take care of the sheep. Because children were, I hate to say it, expendable in those days. But we're not just sheep to God, we're children of God. We've been reading that in John's epistle, and we're going to keep reading John's epistle. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Now, anybody here know anyone who laid down their life literally for someone else? You do? Who? Can I ask you to share that, Frida? Firefighters, police officers. People in the military, we're used to that. Anybody know anybody who did it in a different context? Years ago, I preached a funeral for a young man I'd never met. He had been a member of the congregation I was serving then. He had grown up and moved away. His parents were there, and he died because he was in McDonald's with his girlfriend, and someone came in with a gun. They were getting married in a couple weeks, but she was pregnant with their first child, and someone came in with a gun, and... He put himself, himself between her and his baby and the shooter, and he died. This was a passage I used for his service. Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. But that's not necessarily what Jesus means here, because not everybody's going to be called to do that. You know, you're not going to be called to stand between somebody and a weapon. Although I know you well enough to know if it was your child or a child probably in the congregation, you would do what you could to protect them whether you had a crozier or a stick or whatever, you'd go after them, I know. But look at the next line here. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? That's how you give yourself for someone else in this world. We have to give up some of the things that we love for someone in need. This church is so good at that. You're all so great at mission work. We sent a group to the Dominican Republic. I asked Mike at the first service if he'd ever seen poverty like that in real life before, and he said no. And when I went to Jamaica on a mission trip with my church that I served then, you can see poverty on television. You can say poverty in Baltimore is bad, and it is, in cities around their nation. Even in our community, there are kids probably within shouting distance of this building who went to bed hungry last night that we just don't know about. But in Jamaica, we were in a van. We were going around a corner laughing and singing and having a good time. And suddenly, there was a family living under a rusted box spring, cooking on a brick. You don't see that every day in this nation. We live in the wealthiest nation on earth. Still, people are hungry for food. They're hungry for acceptance and love. And that's what we're called to do in Christ's name. If you want to pastor somebody to do that. I've shared with you many times the story of my husband's last week when my friend, Bishop Peggy Johnson, who has her crozier, it's taller than she is, but she uh, called me up every day and she said to me one day, who is your pastor without thinking? I said, Jack Vineyard, who was the retired pastor in my congregation. I was actually his pastor. But I realized then what a pastor is, not just a shepherd. It's a shepherd who gets you across the dark valley that you'll darkest valley you'll ever face. That's who your shepherd is. You don't have to be a pastor, an ordained minister for that. You can do that for each other. Think about the rough times in your life. Who got you across that valley? Because that's what we're called to do for each other, to walk each other through the darkest valleys we'll ever face. Maybe it's not going to be filled with wolves or lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. But it's going to be filled with heartache and grief, need, desperation. And we're called to shepherd each other through those times. I love John's gospel. I don't preach from it too often because it's just so different than the others. It's not really a 
of the Gospels, they're all proclamations of who Christ is for us, but John is really writing a theological treatise. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and John just writes and writes and writes. You're like, what does this all mean? The line that I love most in John's Gospel, other than Jesus commands us to love one another, is this one here. He lays down his life of his own accord. No one took it from him. He laid it down for us, and he takes it up for us, which means that one day he's going to take us up with him. I know you all so well here. So many of you have suffered great loss since I've been here. Spouses, loved ones, parents. It's hard, isn't it? But don't wait till you die to experience salvation. Salvation, I said for John, means wholeness, peace. Shalom is salvation. Jesus breathes wholeness into us every day. From his first appearances to his disciples after he was raised from the dead through Pentecost, he breathes his spirit into us so we can breathe his spirit out into the world so that other people might know the peace of Christ that we have sustains us. He does it of his own accord. He lays it down, he takes it up. So don't wait till you're dead to understand salvation begins the moment you get it. The moment you understand that you are a child of God, beloved of God, that is when your new life starts and begins. So the power of the Holy Spirit moves through you and in you and reaches out to others in Christ's name. So don't be like Buford, the sheep. He was a big, ugly mess. I mean, he was so covered with stuff you wouldn't want to touch him. But when he heard the voice of the woman who owned him, he came running. We can't separate this story from the one that Jesus tells right around this one. You know, it's Good Shepherd Son, and they sort of stretch it into three years of talking about Jesus being the sheep gate and the shepherd. It's really about the man born blind. Do you remember that story? It's a man born blind, and Jesus meets him, and he's, he's sitting there in the dirt begging, because that's all you could do if you were blind in the first century, is beg and hope somebody would give you something to live on, hope you could find your way home at night. Jesus spits, puts mud in his eyes and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he goes and he washes. And then people are astounded because they've known this man his whole life. They knew he could never see. But yet they want to trap Jesus and say, who did this for you? But later Jesus calls him, and he understands because he hears his voice. That's why we were talking about sheep hearing their pastor's voice, their shepherd's voice, and recognizing it. You've got to learn to listen for that voice. Just ask yourself today, where do you hear the voice of God? I was in seminary. Every black student who was a friend of mine, when they got their call to ministry, heard God's voice speaking to them out loud. I always felt jealous then. And then God started talking to me out loud, and I thought I'd lost my mind. The time that God asked me to be arrested in front of the South African embassy, I heard the voice. God called me a wuss. I didn't know God knew that word. God said, you wuss? Because I was going down to pray for my boyfriend. He was going to be arrested. I was standing on the other side of the street in safety. God said, go ahead, just stand there while somebody else takes a stand for me. You can just go there and pray, you wuss. Like, okay, Lord, and I went across the street and was arrested. That's the time my mother was just not happy with me at all. We had a great phone conversation I've shared with you before where she said to me, Nice people do not get arrested. I said, Jesus was arrested. And my mother said, I was not his mother, was I? God's going to talk to you if you listen. God will talk to you and call your name and tell you what it is that God has in store for you and you alone. But you have to listen for that voice. And you have to recognize it when it comes. And you have to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Yes, I'm ready to follow wherever you lead. That's going to lead you to love somebody. There are a lot of other voices competing for God's attention in these days. What are some of those voices that you hear that lead you astray? You have to answer that one. What, what voices do you hear? What are the things that keep you from listening to Christ alone? Somebody today said anger at the first service. I said amen. I heard a TV preacher that I thought never said a bad word in his life say the other day, on television, he said, when I'm in traffic and somebody cuts me off, he said, I want to say everything but Jesus to them. I thought, wow, that's good, because that's me. Anger can lead us from Christ. What else can lead us from Christ? Listening to his voice. Fear, amen. What else? Grief can. 
despair can, pain can. All sorts of things can call our names and say, come here. Today we're going to celebrate Scott Enzer's life and his sweet wife, who's a member of our church, and Dottie Johansson's second cousin, Sharon, said, go ahead and say that he was an alcoholic. I want people to know what he overcame because he had been sober for almost six months when he died. There are lots of things that will call your name that aren't going to make you healthy, but Christ called Scott home, and Scott went home. And what we're going to, Lambert's going to play at the service, he's going to sing the prayer that we found in Scott's Bible that he had with in his books on AA. Make me an instrument of your peace where there's hatred, let me sow your love. Because that's what got him from addiction back home to Christ. Whatever it is in your life that calls your name that is not of God, don't listen to that. Listen to the still small voice in your heart that says, I need you, I want you, you are mine. Because that is how Christ will call you and Christ will use you. He'll breathe your spirit into you, breathe salvation into you. Just don't wait until you're dead to know that you're alive. Celebrate the presence of Christ every moment of every day. And you will be on the right track to be following the shepherd, the good shepherd who laid out his life of his own accord. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>